Good morning and welcome to the CEFC Green Room webinar, the third in our series of informative and interesting conversations with um, uh, with you know, senior senior players in the in the clean energy space. And um, so I thank everyone for for joining uh, joining us this morning. Firstly, I'm going to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of the uh, of the land up upon which I am based today. Uh, here in Sydney, in the east of Sydney, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, so we are going to have a conversation with uh, two esteemed uh, executives from Alliance Bernstein uh, this morning, and uh, you can, after we uh, have uh, some Q and A between myself and uh, and my guests, we'll. Uh, I very happily enter into some Q and A from uh, from the audience here, and uh, so feel free uh, if you want to uh, ask some questions through the Q and A box on your screen, uh, and look forward to uh, look forward to seeing some questions uh, pop up. So we've got some international guests this morning, um, for, and they are both based in uh, in the states. We, um, the um, Sharon and Sarah, they, uh, they, they come from um, Alliance Bernstein, who, of course, are a very large uh, funds management group uh, with something like $870 billion Australian dollars of assets under management, $330 billion in equity. So I'm very pleased uh, to have, uh, firstly, Sharon Fay, uh, who joins uh, from uh, from New York. Sharon is the Chief Responsibility Officer of Alliance Bernstein and is a member of the firm's operating committee. As uh, the CRO, she leads in, uh, and oversees the firm's responsible investing strategy while working closely with the senior leadership team to ingrain that sort of behaviour into really right across all the global activities of the firm. Previously, Sharon was um, Global Head of Equities and responsible for the um, Alliance Bernstein Portfolio Management and Research Activities. So welcome, uh, Sharon. Uh, we also have uh, Sharon's colleague, Sarah Rosner, who is the Director of Environmental Research and Engagement at Alliance Bernstein, co-chairing the firm's ESG, uh, ESG uh, committee. So their research, training and thought leadership group and also manages something that we're going to talk a little bit uh, later here in the green room. Alliance Bernstein's collaboration with Columbia University's Earth Institute. And that is a, um, a, 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 a group that's uh, spending time thinking about uh, how investors uh, can enhance their ability um, to or, or enhancing investors' ability really to integrate climate change considerations into their decision making and investment processes. So, um, uh, thank you both for joining. I'm going to start uh, with a question for Sharon, if I, if I can. And you know, obviously, we are in the midst of uh, a, you know, a global pandemic, um, an economic shock that we haven't seen really for uh, an incredibly long time. And I wonder, Sharon, if you might paint in the scene uh, for where, where are equity uh, markets right now in this, in this current environment? Uh, sure, Ian, and thanks for having us. Look, I think that um, if we look at the markets over the last six or seven months, when we go back to March, when the world started to shut down several different economies, it was a really big shock to the market. And you saw a very swift pricing reaction, right? Equities fell precipitously. Many other assets fell in value. Um, and the market started to seize up in terms of liquidity um, because there was so much uncertainty about where's the economy going to go? How's this going to unfold? Um, and liquidity started to get very scarce. I think learning a lesson from the global financial crisis, governments responded very quickly in terms of fiscal stimulus and in terms of monetary policy to ease some of the liquidity constraints. Um, and, and I think what we've seen over the last six to seven months is those actions 
enabled investors to start to see kind of through the fog um, to the other side of where we're where we are right now, right? So the kind of central banks and the and and, and a lot of government officials really greased the the near term uncertainty and put a floor under the economy to some extent. So when this was first unfolding, I was talking to a colleague and we were saying this kind of swift, sudden reaction is something we anticipate might happen when the world starts to really price in the impacts of climate change. But I think what's different about that kind of reaction and, and what we've seen is the pandemic is more of an acute problem, right? It's something that's going to be with us for I don't know, a couple of years, but we can we can imagine a bridge being built from here to some normal environment. With climate, there there is no going back, right? There is no bridge. And so, so I don't think you're going to see the same kind of, oh, once we've kind of taken in the information, the markets will just recover. I think you'll see more of a kind of permanent resetting of some prices. Not everything will get repriced. Um, so I think that if you had asked me in March or April, where did I think the market was going to be now in October, I wouldn't have guessed it recovered as far as it had, given we still don't know a lot about the length of this pandemic, nor the kind of second order economic impacts that are going to be hitting around the globe. So, so I feel like the markets may be a little ahead of themselves, but it was really an optimism built on the authorities are going to help us manage the short-term risk. Yeah, and look, it is it is interesting. I'm sure there are a lot of people who who can't believe that markets seem to be defying gravity with with uh, with COVID. The other, I guess, the other big theme uh, in global equity markets, or certainly influencing uh, equity markets, is. Um, is the U.S. election, and of course, it will have a significant impact depending upon its outcome on climate change uh, and how America and I think the world will will look at that. Um, do you have a feel for, depending upon the outcome of the U.S. election, what the implications might be for how markets will look at climate change uh, and, and you know ca carbon emissions? Yeah, so look, I think, um, you know, Joe Biden has announced his climate plan, right? It's a $4 trillion spending package over four years. I mean, a $2 trillion spending package over four years, which is a lot of money, really to boost renewables and to create incentives for more energy efficient, you know, homes, cars, offices, et cetera. And he's really framing it as a jobs creation package and something that will address the looming climate crisis. Um, he's committed to eliminate carbon pollution from the electric sector by 2035. And he's also said that he would rejoin the Paris Climate um, Accord, right? So he's been very explicit about what he'd like to do. And he's uh, taken a further, let's say, um, kind of racial and social justice lens onto the issue, saying that a good portion of that spending will be in communities that have been historically underserved, right? So it's a very comprehensive package. So if he wins, it's going to be one of his top priorities. Now, that doesn't mean it all gets done, right? So some of, some of the actions he can take as the president with his executive powers but some of these policies will need to go through the legislation. And today, the you know, House of Representatives would be supportive, I think, generally with his package. The Senate, which is controlled by the Republicans today, will definitely stand in the way of this kind of sweeping change. But we don't know that the Senate will, the Senate will remain Republican, right? I think our election is very, very difficult to forecast right now. So if you have, if you end up with a sweep, a democratic sweep of the presidency, the House and the Senate, I think you could see very swift and substantial action on the part of the US. Um, I think if you have more of a divided government, you'll see some progress, 
but it won't be at the same pace. Um, but it's going to be very interesting to watch. Um, well, it, it certainly it certainly will be very interesting, and it is very interesting uh, to watch. So, um, yes, and I think um, look, it will it will have a huge impact on where, where things head. I was just going to uh, maybe turn to to Sarah and um, and pose uh, some questions to you, if if that's all right, Sarah. I mean, obviously. Uh, you know, the pandemic has have, has given us a, a kind of a unique op opportunity to kind of reset people's uh, attention, and it's uh, you know there's been a lot of focus about what are the inherent risks uh, in uh, particular sectors and, and companies in relation to that. Um, you know, I was wondering whether the, there's a, been a parallel with with that the pricing of risk um, in terms of. Uh, you know, climate risks uh, that we are learning from, uh, you know, the, the pandemic. And I wonder maybe if you could you could tell us um, a bit about your thoughts there. Sure. Uh, thank you, Anne, and, and thank you to everyone for joining us this morning. Um, if you're in Asia for APAC, um, so I think you know the pandemic has really provided a number of precedents um, to us as investors that really up until this point were much more in the abstract when it came to climate. Um, you know, one of the things that we had um, hypothesized about was when we were thinking about climate pre-pandemic was would there ever be a situation where we would see um, governments or authorities actually ratchet down um, economic growth in order to combat some greater challenge? Um, and we really couldn't have uh, envisioned that happening, but now we actually have um, that data point, and and I think that that has you know uncovered a, a whole series of um, similarities. I think in terms of what we see between the pandemic and and the potential impacts of the climate. Um, for example, events are very highly interrelated and nonlinear. Um, there are multiple feedback loops that have complex and daunting downstream effects. Um, we really need to start looking at risk from um, untraditional sources. Um, for example, um, decades of focusing on the efficiency of procurement strategies has really left many issuers um, very vulnerable. Um, and that, that focus on efficiency has, um, in this instance, and we also you know, think in the instance of time, it could create, has created its, its own very real costs. Um, you know, kind of alluding to Sharon's points, talking about social and racial justice, I think one of the analogies that we see is that um, the pandemic, um, just like climate, has really exposed um, the vulnerability in certain segments of society. And we've now recognized that if we're not addressing those most vulnerable communities, the entire system really is at risk. And I think that's something that we've absolutely observed um, in terms of the overwhelming of the healthcare system when it came to the pandemic, particularly here in New York, and how that just affected the global markets. Um, you know, and, and obviously there's there's a lot of different tentacle here, tentacles here. Um, climate is not just about the weather. Um, and we really think that all of this points to the fact that there is no real single simple solution um, to think about it in a binary way is, is not really going to be um, practical or effective um, and, and we really think that the answers have to be more nuanced um, and, and we as investors have to be multidisciplinary in terms of how we approach how we're thinking about this issue um, and really and really holistic in, in our perspective. Um, and finally, I would say that, you know, I, I think that the pandemic and in terms of the relationship to climate has in some ways presented an opportunity and that is to build our economies back um, better and, and greener. Um, you know, I think Sharon obviously pointed out to, to uh, Vice President Biden's plan. Um, and it's certainly uh, an example of, of how one economy can do that. And there's also been overtures um, in this regard from several other countries and regions, Europe, um, multilaterals as well. So I, I think that's something that we're absolutely focused on as investors too. <clears throat> Thank you for that. The you know, while I've got you, Sarah, um, I'd be interested to hear uh, a bit about your the work that you're doing with Columbia University and 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 the, with 
what's known as the Earth Institute and whether, you know, you, are you discussing and thinking about now these sorts of issues uh, with Colombia? Yeah, so um, I think that's a great question. So we embarked on our collaboration with Columbia University's Earth Institute uh, in September of last year. So we're approaching our one year anniversary um, as partners, I think, in, in this endeavor. Um, and the, uh, just to kind of give some context, so the Earth Institute is a research, umbrella research organization within Columbia University that houses um, about 24 different research centers um, that all focus on various aspects of earth and natural sciences. Um, and one of the things that, that really um, attracted us to the center was their focus, or the, Institute, the Earth Institute is their focus on um, taking scientific research and discovery and actually bringing that to bear on the real world decisions that are facing um, businesses, governments, um, and, and investors like ourselves um, as, as we face a, a phenomenon like climate change as well as a changing environment. Um, in addition to that, they're very uh, just, you know, I think one of the things, the glue that holds our organizations together is the focus on, you know, very fundamental um, research. Obviously, they bring that from the, the scientific community. We bring that in terms of our experience in, in the financial markets. But, um, you know, both organizations place a tremendous amount of value and have a pedigree in, in that area in particular. Um, and then finally, just going back, I think, to our comments about, you know, just the, the pervasive nature of climate. Um, you know, these, these the research that's going on at the Earth Institute touches on all, I think, so many different aspects of how this affects um, society um, and the environment, um, whether that's, again, social and racial justice, health. Um, you know, we were fortunate enough to have access to um, several epidemiologists who also happen to be climate scientists um, to help us kind of think through, um, you know, our, our, our approach to um, finding the, the analogies between the pandemic and climate. Um, and I'll just say that at this point, you know, the first chapter of our collaboration has really been focused on developing um, a climate science and portfolio risk curriculum. So a curriculum, a, a training program for our investment professionals at AB um, that really would A, help um, you know, establish uh, a fundamental understanding of uh, the science behind climate change, and then progressing from there into um, all different aspects. I know we touched on um, the epidemiology. We've also done modules on, on data and modeling. We've had access to experts in global policy and litigation when it comes to climate change. Um, and then obviously we're, we're very interested in the solutions portion. I think all of our investors uh, come out of this number one with more questions than they have answers. And then number two with wanting to, to be part of the solution. And so um, that's, that's also something that we focused on the collaboration so far. Thank you. Thank you for that. Fascinating. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we'll, we'll sort of watch that with much interest. So talking about investors, as you say, um, question for Sharon, really, as we kind of bringing it, uh, you know, back to the, the, the sort of the investment universe. And ha Sharon, how, how do you think <clears throat> global investors today are thinking and positioning or thinking about how climate change is, is affecting their portfolios and what they're doing about that? Yeah, Ian, I think we're at the very early stages, to be honest with you, of being able to appropriately kind of factor that into our thinking. Um, you know, I've said to our board of directors that I don't think climate change is priced into assets today and that our job as fiduciaries is to understand how to do that and anticipate the likely changes in asset values before they happen, right? I wanna be on the right side of that adjustment. and. You know, the, the, thing that's, the thing that's true about this is it's just really hard to do. It's not that investors are not trying or not believing that it's important to understand this, but we're not used to considering kind of complex um, 
systems like this with multiple feedback loops and and all the different ways that climate is likely to alter society and economies, right? There, there's some re potentially really large impacts. Um, there's no good historical analog for us to turn to. And investors tend to define risk by looking at the past and saying, well, what can I learn about kind of similar situations? And so we don't have a lot of, we don't really have a good model of historical precedents to guide us. Um, and that, and I think in many instances, investor time horizons are not always aligned with the time horizon of climate change, right? So I think a lot of times people are saying, well, look, I'm really looking at holding this asset over the next five years. And so how much is really going to change in five years, right? Like this is a, you know, I think a lot of people are saying this is a slow moving um evolution, I think one of the things we're learning is it's not always slow and it's going to come in episodic um, ways, whether that's bushfires or storm damage or other physical manifestations. And so, look, I think we're in the early days of trying to figure this out. Um, what we've said is, look, we cannot let the complexities deter us from trying. And that was really um, a, a huge impetus behind our collaboration with Columbia is we knew we didn't have all the answers. We didn't have anywhere close, but by partnering with some scientists and academics, we could really enhance our knowledge and together maybe find, you know, in that kind of Venn diagram of knowledge, where can we really bring both ex sets of expertise to bear on giving us greater insights. And, and part of that, Sharon surely has to be about um, available information and disclosure by, um, you know, by you know, listed listed companies both you know, globally, and we you know we're conscious of that in Australia. Do you think that's sort of an, obviously you know that must be a key element, and, and is that is that progressing? Are there you know is that being slowed down? And where is disclosure in the in the yeah. conversation? I'll start and then I'll let Sarah pick up because she's been having a lot of, you know, individual engagements with companies and our analysts on this question. But there is some progress, right? As as you know, many on the call know that a number of years ago, um, you know, uh, eight central banks got together and said, "Look, we've got to actually worry about the systemic risks that could be posed by this." Right? Our job is stability, right, as a central bank. Um, and they, in turn, turned to Mike Bloomberg, who put together the task force on climate-related financial disclosures, right, who really came up with, I think, a very sound framework for companies and issuers to disclose around. And we are seeing increased take up of those types of statements, right? So we're just about to publish our first TCFD statement, and I can tell you we learned a lot in the process um, of, you know, kind of what are our next steps and what do we need to do, and it, I think it really helped illuminate for us the process that many issuers are going through as they're doing this. And I, you know, I'm hopeful that we'll get some convergence over time of accounting standards around this. Um, but today, we don't have that, right? I think that at some point, it needs to become less voluntary and more dictated by regulators. Um, but companies are adopting it even if the regulators aren't forcing them because their investors are asking for this. So, so I do feel like we are on a path of improvement, but disclosure alone won't help you figure it all out, right? It just helps you get more information. Uh, there, But there's a lot of, I'd say, engagement with the issuers to, you know, once something's been disclosed to really probe a lot deeper about strategies and how they're going to, how they're going to um, kind of track those over time. But, but um, maybe Sarah, you had something else you wanted to add in there. Yeah, I, I think we definitely see some movement along this um, spectrum, if you will, in terms of issuer um, success when it comes to managing climate risk and opportunity. And I think generally what we see, there's a couple of different stages. So I think number one is, you know, does 
the, the issuer might have a policy um, or some language on a statement on how it's addressing this. And from there, it might move to actually measuring um, some of that risk, um, whether that's scope one through three emissions or um, you know, trying to quantify a carbon price as it would affect their assets. Um, and then what we see, I think, is what we see in the next stage is more strategy and, and governance in terms of how um, the, the issuer might be um, really internalizing and integrating this into their long-term viability as a business. And then finally, what we, what we look at, and I think we spend a lot of time looking at and trying to be more critical about our, our metrics and targets. And so how is the issuer um, holding itself accountable um, to managing this type of risk and opportunity? And um, I think one of the, you know, one of the advantages that we have as active managers is through the engagement process um, in terms of, you know, not just probing the, the companies that we're investing in, in terms of how meaningful um, their strategy and performance is in this area, but also, you know, we as global investors, um, you know, we touch all corners of the financial markets. And so we're, we're really able to leverage, I think, a lot of our own um, internal insights that we get from engaging on this broad basis and, and kind of can kind of almost partner with, with these companies at, in certain ways in terms of um, sharing best practice that we're seeing um, from others in the industry or that, that they're in or, or even more broadly. And, and Sarah, do you think it's um, the attention is um, divided between in terms of, you know, in, investors looking at issuers and in their underlying activity? Uh, is it, is, it, is it as much about mitigation of climate change and, and the risks that come with that as well as just what they're actively doing to abate uh, carbon emissions? Or is it, is it a combination of the two? Yeah, so I think there's certainly um, there's certainly some nuances there. I think it's depending on which um, sector or industry that the company is in, um, whether or not um, physical versus that transition risk might be um, one might take priority over the other. Um, certainly, for example, you know if we are engaging with um, a REIT here in the U.S. who has a significant portfolio in um, the southeastern coastal United States, um, we would certainly, you know, think that the, or we would certainly want to know what, how the company is thinking about physical risk um, to its assets and, and hardening those. Um, whereas I think maybe for um, an oil and gas major, certainly, um, you know, certainly there's physical risk to their assets, but we'd also you know, or, or an airline, for example, we'd also want to know, you know, how they're thinking about the potential for um, something like a carbon uh, tax or, or a carbon market and what that could mean um, for, for their business in the long term. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I, I want to take um, the opportunity also just to mention a, um, an investment product that, of course, we've collaborated with Alliance Bernstein here in Australia on uh, bringing it, bringing it uh, you know, back a bit, a bit more locally. Um, and for those that don't know, in, um, in December 2018, we, uh, you know, we worked with the team here in Australia, the AB team here in Australia, um, to uh, cornerstone of what effectively what's described as a green alpha uh, uh, listed securities product. Um, and we uh, committed $50 million uh, to that alongside uh, some other uh, family offices and the My Foundation were in there. And um, it's a, sort of a managed volatility fund that is, you know, is targeting companies that are you know, either you know, addressing, you know, addressing this issue um, or you know, are perceived to have less volatility because you know, their exposure is it is you know, far less exposure to uh, the challenges of climate change. And it's performed extremely, extremely well to date. And I think um, in, in this year against, compared with the index, which is the ASX 300, I think it's uh, ahead by something like uh, nearly 10%. So we're really pleased with that, uh, with that product and that collaboration with, with the team. Um, I, I wonder, Sharon, whether I, I might ask you, as someone who must see a lot of, 
differing products in this space. You know, what, what is that, uh, you know, the, the offering uh, in, in, in products it, it generally in this in this world? Is there a lot? Are they, are they high quality? Is there a challenge to, to find, you know, good investment products that, that deliver on this, that, this sort of theme? Yeah, so Ian, I, I think the industry is still in an, its nascent stage. Um, so there, I'll, I'll share with you a couple of interesting things this year. So first of all, um, the fastest growing segment within listed markets, so within listed equities and fixed income, is ESG aligned or sustainable investment strategies, right? Those are far outpacing the growth of any other segment of the market. Um, most of those tend to be broad portfolios, not specifically focused on climate um, or environmental issues. They tend to be kind of broader, more global strategies. But increasingly, we are seeing a subset of climate-related strategies, and those are being offered by both passive and active managers. And, and I, I think of them in a couple of different buckets or a few different buckets. Right, The first is there's a uh, I'd say a real interest in low carbon portfolios. So that's just portfolios that have a reduced carbon footprint. A lot of the money has gone into passive strategies and and simply, you know, they are following like an exclusion based path, right? If you want to have low carbon, let me just exclude issuers who have high carbon footprints. So while it is reducing your your risk, to carbon, for sure. I'm not sure it's achieving a whole lot else in an investor's portfolios, right? There's a role for that. And passive is probably taking more share in that. And where the active, I think, strategies have really been garnering a lot of interest is much more around climate transition. So more focused on solutions, like improvements to practices, best in class for kind of adopting or alleviating the impacts. Um, and there, management engagement is key because you're really trying to understand what's the future trajectory of this company and their strategies. Um, and passive just can't capture that, right? It's, it's by definition focusing on backward-looking data. And then climate impact funds are similar, but they're really focused on the transition to a low-carbon or carbon-neutral world and really the protection of existing resources. And again, that is heavily engagement reliant and, and where active managers are um, most focused. And so I think that you are starting to see more flows into that. I would say more innovation from managers around sensible strategies. Like you said, are they good or bad? I, I, I don't want to betray some of my, my own biases, which is in this space, I do think active managers have a big leg up because of the engagement component and the forward-looking necessities of doing this type of research. Um, but there is some role for some of those passive strategies from a kind of risk mitigation standpoint. But I, I'd say we're going to see a lot more of that. Most of the flows have happened in Europe. Um, and again, I expect to see that starting to broaden out based on the kinds of client inquiries we're getting. Yeah, um, and look, it, 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 it's interesting. It's, it's, it's also a. Um, I think the Australian market is also looking at, at trying to develop products, and there's that challenge, as you say, between passive and active. Um, I want to turn uh, to some questions that we're we're getting from our audience, and this one's a little bit along that line um, about you know, continuing with you know, how, how do we <clears throat> continue uh, to get creative active engagement opportunities with institutional managers rather than just uh, managers looking at numbers, algorithms and so on. Um, how do we get uh, them to value portfolios that are actively managing climate risk and avoiding stranded investments? Yeah, and I'll let Sarah um, talk a little bit more about the work we're doing here. But I think one, um, again, early in the early stages of development, but there are some climate value at risk models that are being developed in our industry. And what they're attempting to do is look at 
a range of different climate scenarios and attach within a portfolio how much value at risk is there from some of the physical and transition risks that are being forecast. So as you might imagine, these are very complex types of um, issues. And we're looking you know, ourselves to employ these types of tools and then build some additional capabilities on top of what's maybe commercially available out there. Um, and Sarah has been leading this effort um, of a working group within Alliance Bernstein to really try and assess those types of models and vet them in combination with some of our colleagues from Columbia. And Sarah, maybe you could just touch on a couple of key learnings you've had on that, because I, I do think it's a fascinating question. Yeah, so we um, embarked on um, a process to um, implement scenario analysis across our portfolios um, globally. And um, we started doing this, I think, towards the end of getting our investors through the, the training that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and we were very fortunate to be able to kind of collaborate with um, Columbia scientists and faculty on, on this process. And I think it was really a learning opportunity for both of our organizations in terms of um, the scientists helping us be more critical about the models, the data, the inputs um, to, to these products that are on the market. And then in, in terms of what we provided to Columbia, I think it, you know, we kind of really helped them understand more how we were thinking about um, climate risk versus how they might think about that. Um, and, and other, um, I think other issues as well. There's a lot of synergy there. Um, and so, you know, we embarked on this RFP process. It started, I would say, in early, very early Q2. Um, we identified um, a dozen plus different vendors um, to participate as candidates. Um, one of the things that, you know, we've done in-house through the Green Alpha strategy um, that, that was really a beacon for us in this process, I should mention as well, is, you know, um, Roy Maslin and Gates Moss and their team um, actually have performed scenario analysis um, throughout the ASX. Um, and so they they really were able to kind of also help guide us and provide some internal knowledge capital and, into how to um, kind of think through these issues. Um, but I think our findings, um, you know, after a very thorough process, I, I would frame, I think, probably three key takeaways, um, three or four. And number one would be that, you know, the, the, the market for these types of products um, it's very, very nascent. Um, there's a lot of consolidation underway, and I think that's really reflected not only only in the organizations themselves that are kind of marketing um, scenario analysis, but also in in the products that they they have on offer. Um, and by that, I mean you know there's no complete solution in terms of um, a scenario analysis provider that. Um, would that that has you know equal coverage across equities, fixed income, real assets, securities, securitization, et cetera. Um, I think the the other thing to keep in mind is that um, the analyses that you get from provider to provider are highly heterogeneous. So um, you know if you're buying something off the shelf. Um, your metric is going to and how you understand and that information is, is going to be completely or you know how you, you see that information will be completely dependent on the provider and to us um, you know one Friday afternoon we had this internal debate you know we had we had put an issuer through the scenario analysis through through four shortlisted providers and each provider came back with a completely different picture in terms of what the climate risk and opportunity was for this particular company. Um, and luckily enough, we had enough senior investors um, on this working group kind of, uh, you know, pushing this RFP process along who were familiar with this issuer to be very critical about, um, you know, what exactly this issuer was doing and, and how that compared to the way it was being analyzed. And so that I, I think that that was incredibly helpful. And, uh, and we had the scientists, I think, on this on this discussion. So I think that was incredibly helpful in terms of fleshing out just how, um, I don't want to say inconsistent, but how variable 
um, you know, each analysis can be. And I think what that really highlights, I think the final point I would say there is that the value is in these this type of analysis for physical and transition risk um, at the issuer and the, and the portfolio level is um, not really just in, in the product that you're getting off the shelf, but in the um, the ability to interpret that data um, and, and that result um, and, and be able to um, use that, uh, you know, to have the tools to interpret it in a way that that is meaningful in terms of integrating it into a decision process. And I think that that's something that you know, is going to be a long-term endeavor for us at AB in terms of continuing to work with Columbia um, to kind of help us think through um, that process. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, we've probably got time for just the last couple of questions. Um, and look, there's an interesting one here <clears throat> that's, that's asking about uh, to what extent do you think insurers and central banks are driving climate change uh, risk management and in what ways? I mean, obviously insurers are probably one of the most exposed uh, sectors of the, um, uh, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the broader uh, financial services uh, world. And here in Australia, of course, the Reserve Bank has been acknowledging um, climate change and the risks um, to the economy uh, here. Um, so I wonder, I'm not sure who, you probably both have good good thoughts there, but um, it would be, be great to hear uh, from you. I mean, maybe Sarah, do you, do you want to start with that one? Sure. Um, I can start high level. I, I And then, Sharon, it would be great to get your, your thoughts on this as well. Um, I think, you know, first of all, in the absence of a coordinated global regulatory response, um, you know, it's important to understand that there are other institutions that are kind of stepping in to fill this breach when it comes to, um, you know, guiding investors and um, businesses into how to address um, climate risk and opportunity. Um, and I know, you know, Sharon, Sharon mentioned um, the TCFD. I think that that's, you know, a real firm example of um, you know, the type of guidance and frameworks that are out there that can really um, kind of move um, not just one industry or sector, but, you know, move an, an entire um, ethos in terms of um, helping, you know, universally um, issuers and investors think through um, TCFD and, and the, learning, the learning opportunity that that entails by going through the TCFD exercise. Um, I think in terms of the, the insurance, and you know, I, and I don't think you know, as Sharon mentioned, that that effort was really um, catalyzed by by central bankers, and so I think obviously um, we've seen you know that continued um, interest and support, certainly from certain certain countries and, and certain bankers. Um, the other facet of your question, when it comes to um, the insurance question, is that you know they underpin. Um, the viability of so many interest, industries and sectors um, that we really can't underscore enough the vital role that that insurers have to play in raising the profile of this issue. Um, they are moving to better quantify climate risks. Um, you know, we are seeing uh, instances now and in having engagements um, with insurers um, that indicate to us that they are um, kind of um, they are kind of withdrawing certain products and certain services from um, geographies and regions that are that are vulnerable uh, or have proven to be more vulnerable to climate. Like for example, um, Florida or the southeastern coastal United States. Um, and we really think that that is just the beginning. I think as insurers put their um, resources more and more towards um, you know the type of modeling um, that that they are so expert within, um, we're really going to see more and more movement um, in that direction. And that will have mm -hmm. reverberations throughout, um, you know, sector agnostic uh, and industry agnostic. Um, thank you. Any any kind of last thoughts there, Sharon, before we unfortunately uh, bring, bring this to a close? No, no, I think she captured it well. I think that, you know, regulation is one way that we're going to 
address this, but there are many market forces at work, and you mentioned some of them. Um, and in the U.S., one of the interesting panels we did with Columbia was really about how litigation is starting to change companies' behavior. So there's, there are many different avenues to kind of, um, I'd say, pushing companies to adopt more sustainable policies long term. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Um, and um, you know, we could have we could have spent uh, a lot more time covering what is obviously an enormous, an enormous issue. Um, so, look, I really want to uh, you know, take this opportunity to thank uh, Sharon Fay and Sarah Rosner from Alliance Bernstein, who stayed up. Uh, well, it's kind of well into the evening there on the uh, on the east coast of America. So, uh, thank you both very much uh, on behalf of the CEFC. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to to have a chance to talk to you about this uh, extraordinary topic. Um, and you know, thank if, thanks if, to everyone who um, who dialed in on this morning's uh, webinar here, the Green Room series number three, and. Uh, I hope you enjoy your evenings or your days, and we uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, at the next one. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.